and I was flunking that course cold until I went to Dave Frisch on bended knee and said, what's wrong? He says, my son, you have the same problem I do. You've got to visualize stuff before you can understand it. He gave me a book by Hugh Skilling. I got 100 on every exam after that, and I got a, a, uh, a good grade in the course, and I figured never again am I going to tackle a partial differential equation like symbols. My, my junior year I spent with Bell Labs, my summer of my junior year I spent with Bell Labs, and I designed and built and they patented a digital computer. That was 1950. And it was a serial machine, but it was rather clever, I thought at the time. <coughs> I didn't get all three degrees. I was missing a thesis in physics and chemical engineering. And I was all set with a fellow, with a fellow assistantship with Whirlwind for my first year of graduate school. Uh, instead, NSF came through with a fellowship, and I went to work with Don Campbell in the uh, feedback control area, where I thought, aha, I can combine that in the area of process control. My, I don't quite think of my intellectual development like John does. Uh, by that time, I was starting to see people as individuals at MIT and dividing them into two camps. Those that I really liked and I could talk to, and those that I really didn't understand and who looked at me cross-eyed. Uh, and I also started to get up into department politics. Not really, but as an instructor, I went to faculty meetings and I said, holy shit, uh, here are these bright people debating how many angels can dance on the hand of the pin. And I never went to a faculty meeting again. Uh, I saw... John Campbell, who These had been brought in. Departmental faculty meeting? No, 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 the whole, the whole McGillop, MIT. Oh, Department meetings are even worse, but that's mm. another story. Because yeah. uh, they degenerated. Don Campbell <laughs> and Gordon Brown were in the midst of a fallout when I was doing my doctoral work on analyzing a, uh, a chemical process, in particular a mass transfer distillation tower simulating it on Whirlwind, this was in 53, and designing a computer control for it. About that time I got convinced that it had, the computer had to be smarter. But still, a computer has always been to me nothing more than a glorified machine tool. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's the way I look at it, I'm sorry. Uh, about that time I got to know Norbert Wiener, because Gordon Brown and Don Campbell were still talking to each other, and gotten Norbert together to put on a program for CBS television, I think it was. And Norbert needed some toys to play with. So I built him some. And he was expounding on the philosophical implications of a device I had built to go chase after light. Yeah. And I was laughing my head off. <laughs> and we got to talking. And I told him, you know, Dr. Wiener, that isn't how it really works. And he chuckled, and we got to be friends. And he was working with our laboratory at that time, and I decided that, hey, you know, the, the science of the future for engineering really is how does the human mind work? Pretentious as hell. But still, uh, the way Norbert saw it and the way we saw it was there were so many problems that people could solve so readily that if you really worked at it, you'd have to stand on your head to get a machine to do Maybe if you bit off a small enough piece, you might make some progress. But in any event, I got my doctorate and swore I'd never come back to MIT because Campbell's blood was on the floor and about four other guys, Bill Linville and a few others had gotten purged. They didn't fit in either. And I went to the Navy and spent four glorious years watching equally bright people fight with each other without killing each other. It was sort of the difference between the ritual courting of bull, whatever, uh, deer in the forest in the Navy. They'd never hurt each other so bad that the guy would die. Uh, they were friends afterwards. MIT, it looked like you not only had to get him out of the way, but you also had to make sure he wasn't moving anymore. At least that's the way I saw it. After four glorious years in the Navy, having a glorious time sitting in the console of my own 705 computer, and playing games with other machines, and working on a problem of 
Actually, the intellectual problem I had to keep my, me uh, going was uh, uh, trying to write a program that would decode a program. In other words, given a set of code, let a computer figure out what it was doing. And it was a tough problem. But I was making some progress with it when I came back to MIT. Uh, I didn't, I was going to go to either Stanford or RAND or MIT, and I figured uh, the guys at RAND are working on war. I've had enough of building nuclear powered guided missile submarines. MIT may still be a zoo, but at least it's a zoo I know. Uh, so I came back. Uh, I had left as an assistant professor. And I came back just as Gordon Brown was leaving the stage for, for uh, Jerry Wiesner, and I didn't know Jerry. In fact, most of the principal cast of characters I no longer knew. Hazen was a good friend of mine, and Hazen was gone. Bill Linville was my buddy, Bill Linville was gone. I had no mentor. And at MIT, that's a hell of a position to be caught in. And I came back, and I was looking for something to do so I could do what I really wanted to do. Uh, John McCarthy was interested in time-sharing machines, and he had a bunch of hardware and some people who were working with him, uh, and I said, okay, I'll connect a few flexor writers to the system, and just maybe, I didn't tell, I don't know who I told this to, probably just Norbert. I figured if I could connect Norbert Wiener to a computer, that would be good. And Norbert <laughs> said, not ever are you going to get me to sit down at a keyboard. So I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll, run, I'll invent a device and build a system that will recognize your symbols and your handwriting if you'll do it. And he agreed. So I figured, okay, I can keep the bread on the, uh, on the table by adding computers, I mean, terminals to the 704 so that other people can do time sharing. I can work on my intellectual problems and be the grand and glorious professor, and we'll all go to the seashore. It didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, probably a hell of a lot of it was my own fault. But as I say, I was young. I didn't really appreciate what John was saying about artificial intelligence, because frankly it sounded terribly pretentious to me. I thought the problem was a hell of a lot bigger than merely symbol manipulation. John seemed to me not really to appreciate that there was more to design and constructing and organizing computers than putting in an erupt or doubling memory and whatnot. We were friends for a very short time, as I recall. We gave a paper together at an ACM meeting in the fall of 1960. Uh, early in 1961, MIT, apparently according to this report, put together a policy committee comprised of Bill Morris, Bob Fano, yeah. June 1960, the MIT administration set up an ad hoc faculty committee comprising Professors Fano, Hill, Morris, and Wiesner, with Professor Hill as chairman. Al Hill called me in and said, Teeger, I want you to do a thorough report on what MIT as a whole needs in the way of computation over the next 10 years. He says, if you don't, I'll kill you. Uh, don't give me a, a someone's opinion. Back up whatever you do. Now, I, I liked Al Hill. He was singing my kind of music. Uh, this was an engineer who had organized a very complex project during the war. And I think he kind of liked me, and, and uh, I could kid him without feeling he was going to jump all over me. Uh, so I did. Uh, we put together a committee. It turned out for six months, I and about three others had to do all the damn work. This is a personal view. Uh, we then had a rough draft ready that somebody leaked to Jerry Wiesner on the evening that we were honoring Norbert Wiener. Jerry Wiesner got up and said, MIT has decided to get a stretch computer. And the fat was in the fire. No one talked to me on the committee the next day. And the committee, the, there were two committees. There was a steering committee, and then there was a working committee, of which I was chairman. My working committee and I had had reasonably good relations, as long as I didn't ask anybody to do any work. Uh, but then when we had a tentative report, P. 
people thought there was something going on that they didn't know of behind the scenes, or at least it seemed that way. There was a blow up, I got angry, there were two committee reports put out, and with the exception of building a tablet and uh, uh, programming it to recognize people's handwriting, Norbert died by then, uh, that's about it as far as me and computers. Uh, but in summary, I didn't think then time sharing was really the issue. It was putting computation at the hands of the people who had problems. There was an ONR and NSF grant that we had that we had gotten. I think John and I went down to see Marshall Yavitz September of 1960, something on that order. And it was Man Machine Interaction was the title of it. I was very much concerned, as I said, with be, not being a symbol manipulator to get something which would work with graphics. And this was sort of my concept of the future. Uh, a console with a screen where a guy could use handwriting and what, I got a better picture of the damn thing. Uh, but this is a reasonably thorough piece of work, I find on rereading it. There were two places I screwed up royally. I didn't predict integrated circuits. I figured that the price of of memory was always going to be significantly higher than the price of logic. And I completely underestimated how fast things would grow if the government needed them for ballistic missile computers. Uh, integrated circuits, I find, looking back, they were available back at that time, but in the form of a logic that went slow as molasses in February. Transistors looked like they had an upper limit. And I screwed up. I was I took the word of the guys at Lincoln, and they really didn't know. Uh, well, that can't be the issue. What? Well, because there was no, quite good computers turned out to be made of transistors for quite a long time. The issue was cost, John. No, but even at no. low cost, because the KA10, uh, which was still made of transistors, came out in '68. Well, that was eight, seven years later. That's right. But the point is that transistors, in 1960, transistors still had a long period of decreasing cost. Oh, yeah. Uh, and increasing performance. And I talked to the wrong specialists. Mm -hmm. Those guys said, well, and they were talking about one type of construction. They were talking about a barrier Mesa germanium transistor. And I thought they were talking for the world. No, they no. said there was a limit of capacitance in the base region that would look like they'd hit a stone wall at about 10 nanoseconds. And at that time, they were only able to work with storage times on the order of 50. I figured, well, if these guys are saying a factor of five and a stone wall, maybe they know what they're talking about. Yeah, you right? are not but alone. You see, that, that's, uh, that 10 nanoseconds in fact, it wasn't met for quite some time and proved to, proved to be quite adequate for yeah. quite high performance uh, well, computer. Well, well, there was some other. I was a consultant for a French computer company in 1966, and they had half nanosecond off the line transistors that they thought might be too slow to put in the machine they were then deciding. And also the cost was 10 times higher. Well, it's a side issue anyway. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I think on a subject of that report, I think that uh, there were really, as you say, there were two reports. Uh, but the problem, I think, stemmed from the fact that, uh, that I guess the majority of the committee uh, parted company from you on the question of how, how precisely well, how much one should rely on a manufactured product, which the stretch kind of was reputedly to be. It, was, it became clear afterwards that IBM goofed on it as a product because they let the customers design it. And as a result, it was Baroque architecturally and didn't perform well. Uh, for the, it wasn't cost effective. But uh, the, rem the majority of the committee, I think, wanted to see uh, more of a uh, request for proposal and trying to solicit out of a manufacturer uh, and or doing a search over all possible machines for a, be a more 
appropriate machine. And so they, the argument in part was over the uh, specificness of, of the one report versus the, the one that subsequently came out, which was more of an RFP uh, with uh, performance requirements and, and functional specifications rather than a specific brand. You know, in hindsight, I think it would have been a mistake for us to go for the stretch. That's easy. At the time, it was just more of a gut feeling on the part of the committee. You know, in, um, in my opinion, in hindsight, um, we should have gone for the stretch. Yeah. I uh, because what you did go for was the 709. Right. And you stayed with it for a good three years. Uh, no, I think no, that no, Tiger was, uh, that about that point, Herb was right and the rest of us were wrong. Uh, however, Probably when, no, I, when I think about the, no, we went for neither. What, no, when we, I think about the RFP, no, we, uh, we, we should have done that too. But um, we, we, no, we, we were all off. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, we didn't, we go, didn't, for didn't go for anything. That that procurement no, no, never no. came about. Yeah, well, but that was not our fault. That was True. Stratton's fault. True. Um, okay. Well, that's your gripe with Stratton. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I was out of it and, and sick. partly IBM's fault. But uh, uh, well. My Let's recollection see. was that uh, we got s started looking for machine, and I remember uh, Al Hill telling me, you got to go and, and, and get in touch with all sorts of companies and get the proposal. And then I think at some point, uh, Bradley went to see Strata and convinced him that there was no point in doing that, that IBM was going to provide everything that was needed. Is that, is that check with your collection? Uh, what was the date? Oh, I mean, this that was uh, 61. 61. Was uh, when, when that report was written. That was before I went to Lincoln. In spring 61. Yeah, or yeah I, like I think that. that's probably... Yeah, probably and... Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole thing was put to rest at the moment. Well, I, I'd like to... You know, to, to, it, it, it seemed to me that what it, we've gone into this area, uh, and uh, there's a, a lot which has been left out, and uh, I, I would like to sort of uh, mention a, a lot of things that were that were left out. Uh, the uh, first, um, all right. Uh, after this. Um, I want to take things starting from the time that there was this proposal to modify the 704 to um, be able to put it into trapping mode from the outside and to go via the, trans uh, the sense switches. Um, IBM agreed to that, but at that time we heard about the real-time package for the uh, 704. And the real-time package w had interrupts and it was clear that that was a superior way to do things. And at that time, we began to campaign to get the real-time package. And this took about a year for IBM to come around to wanting to cooperate with the time-sharing project oh, sufficiently. When was that? What is the date? Oh, must have been before January 59, 59. or 60. Well, is that before your memorandum dated January 1st, uh, 59. 59, where you proposed some modification? Well, no, the modifications that were proposed in 59 were more extensive. Yeah, this yeah, is so this, this, uh, this I told you one of the memory protect and a memory relocate. That's right. Relocate. That's that's right. right. And you and that, I worked that out sometime around the fall of 59. That's, that's right. correct. Yeah. But no, this you would work with earlier with them. I'm, right? I'm talking about this. This is something earlier. This probably okay, would right. have been. That's what I wanted. Judging from 58, that man. fact, uh, this is a one type I came enough. in 57, okay. that is, as a visitor, and then came permanently in 58. So I would have thought that the rate things were going, it would have had to have been early in 58 that we heard about the real-time package and started to campaign for it, or even because otherwise we would have gone through with this, uh, with this modification that yeah, IBM was, had agreed to do. There was an evolution. You first started trying to tie up a single typewriter through the sense switches and the direct data uh, device. <coughs> it later just being thinking more of time sharing uh, with multiple terminals. Well, uh, I was thinking about time-sharing from the beginning, or at least that's Perhaps, my recollection that I was, although I can't prove it, even what, to myself. What do you mean by campaigning for the real-time package? 
Just what he said. Trying to persuade IBM. Yeah. Remember, at that time, we didn't. The computation did, center didn't have any money of its own. That if we wanted some hardware, we had to get IBM to give it to us. We had, that was we my had picture. some money we for had some research assistantships and so on, but, well, but absolutely nothing for, for hardware. It was also complicated by the fact that attaching oneself to the machines of those days required penetrating the interface, and IBM had no official interfaces to ex attach to the machine, and this was one of their few official interfaces. Right. Now, this had been developed did, by just Boeing, like or in a, that is, it had been developed by IBM in response to a request from Boeing who wanted to attach wind tunnels. Now, uh, there's one question that I have in that connection as to who invented interrupts. Must have been you. No, it wasn't me, because, wasn't me. I mean, I thought of, it wasn't at MIT. It was uh, because this package had interrupts associated with it. Flowers and it, had we had what? Flowers had interrupts on it. Flowers said so. Whether that got transferred to later technology, I don't know. I, I should think, think that too. Uh, I well, think that well, um, must have. How, how would the idea have gotten from Colossus to Boeing when the existence of Colossus was still a John? Story? It oh, was on Whirlwind. Exactly. It was on the dark side of the house that neither Corby yeah, and I yeah. really penetrated. Uh huh. Because in, in, in air traffic control... They need it. it. They need it. Uh, yeah. two at least. All right, but it, for example, it was not That's in the, um, the ANFSQ-7. It was not in the um, air defense computer. That that one did all of its work by polling. At least that's what I, an article <coughs> that I recently read said. I think they reinvented the wheel four times. Yeah. Uh, uh, because so we were in very early had uh, interactive uh, displays. At one point that, that's not... Interactive displays don't require, don't require interrupts. If you are willing to program so that you will guarantee that uh, the program polls with sufficient frequency, then you can handle... Yeah, but that's laborious. Real, it is laborious, yeah. but that is, for example, the way the SAGE system worked. Uh, so it would be hard to imagine that interrupts were very early on Whirlwind, otherwise they would have, it would have been clear that they would have been on the SAGE system since then. But that idea was well established by the time we were working yeah. with, with computers in the time-sharing architecture. Well, that, that's something that we should, that somebody should track down yeah. who wants to well, write a history in, of that. Well, they were in the 709s for sure. Uh, only as part of a real-time package. Now, the interrupts? That's my no, the opinion. channels interrupt. Oh, maybe you're right. There were sure. channel programs uh, already. Okay, well anyway, there was this real-time package and we campaigned to get that. Then there was the question of the single FlexoRider uh, connection. Mm -hmm. Now, this was developed, I believe, by Arnold Siegel. But Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and it was somehow a consequence of the instigation that I had done, or at least I suppose it was, uh, but I was not in any direct supervisory connection with it. I think Dean Arden supervised it uh, in that way, so he had accepted uh, this as a kind of outsider's uh, suggestion, as far as I could see. And it became available, and then at some time, there was developed in the AI group uh, with Steve Russell really doing a lot of the work, the uh, time-stealing mode. And what the time-stealing mode, which is intended as a prototype of time-sharing, uh, consisted of... Um, we had at that time this uh, fast batch, which consisted of jobs with a one-minute one time limit. And the time stealing consisted of using the interrupt package to be able to type in characters on an interrupt basis while uh, another job was running. And then between jobs, you could all you could sneak in the um, the special job that is the one that was that was interacting through the terminal. And uh, this was done only for a demonstration. And then there was this sort of uh, this Lisp demonstration that was done for the uh, inter uh, the liaison industrial liaison office, 
and I'm not sure when that was, but I think it would be would have been sometime in '59. Oh, oh, much later. Could have been '58. Uh, what? Much later. Much yeah. later. Well, because you're probably... I hadn't even completed the design of the yeah. three flexor. But it wasn't rider. done with the three flexor rider thing. It was done there with was the never one flexor rider thing. Flexor yes, there was. No, sir. Well, now I that placed that in the context no, of our writing the reports, and we were. Arnold Siegel proposed mm -hmm. in a memo to Phil Morse early in '59 that a single flexor rider be added. It was never done because we didn't have the, have, even have the circuit diagram for what pins were on IBM's plug. I had to get that from IBM myself by oh, mid '59. Well, mid '59, I proposed to Phil Morris a three flexor writer, clock, photoelectric tape reader, and I don't think I was then talking about multiplex graphical output units. No. It was built by December '61. Marjorie were Merwin. And some of, of Corby's other programmers modified the operating system so it was compatible. And we were all friends at that point. You took Phil, your, your boy Russell did something special for LISP for reasons I, I didn't really know at the time. But you couldn't have done it before early in 62. Well, or at least that's what these memos say. All right. Now, um, that, uh, I, think my, my that you're, I think you're mistaken. Well, I think that there was a one flexor rider thing, and yeah, that your project was to, to make a three flexor rider. No, thing. there was never a one. If there had been one, I wouldn't have touched the project with a 10 foot pole. There might have been a one project, a one terminal demo somewhere along the line. And I, I'm, I, rec I recall of such a demo. I don't recall the date very well, except I kind of placed it in the period when we were writing the reports, which would be 61-ish. By then, we already had to... But this is just a demo. It wasn't a regular thing. Uh, the And it could have very well been the whole machine tied up supporting the demo. That's, All right. If one really but, but should ask Siegel. The thing that I'm... The, the, just to pick up on Herb's point in the chronology, Herb had built this uh, three, type, three flexo uh, controller, uh, which, in fact... Uh, was tricky to use. Uh, I would say uh, we had trouble figuring out how to make it work, uh, but we did, and it was a, it was the only link we had to getting uh, any typewriter. It was a very yeah. valuable step, and we started in the quick and dirty in the, about the, in the early of '61, and were able to give a demo. <coughs> I remember working furiously that summer trying to get it hammered down, and gave a demo, a crude demo, in November of '61. That was, and that was our kind of our first benchmark, to show you how crude it was, we had no secondary storage for each of the uh, programs. Uh, we had to, we split the main memory of 32K words into 5K for the supervisor, the whole operating system. Uh, 5K, yeah, right. And uh, the other 27 were for the users. And uh, the, uh, but this, the secondary storage for each of the three Flexo writers was in a complete IBM tape drive all by itself. And we were storing the programs off on the tape drive. Disk files were unknown. Mm -hmm. Disk files were unknown, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So it was really they crude. Were unknown, we just didn't have it. The well, they were just beginning. They were just beginning, and we didn't have it. Uh, they were just beginning. The first disk drums file. Drums were known, but disk files weren't known. First disk file arrived at MIT, I believe, in the very early summer of 63. And well, that, we were waiting. The, yeah, and that's true. But you see, the the point about the RAMAC was that IBM had to built the RAMAC not as a device to attach to its big computers, but as some kind of separate inventory system yeah. to compete with RCA's yeah. Yeah. this file system. Yeah, yeah that's uh, right. okay. And it was to compete at the low level. Yeah. Well, well, let, let me go. Uh, I'd, li yeah. I'd like to uh, mention a, a few corroborative details anyway for my view of what happened there, which we're which just going to have to resolve to somehow. Because I'll finish otherwise. What? <laughs> which period are you trying to talk about? The earlier period okay. before this thing. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, right. Because I remember being very much annoyed by the following fact. Uh, I was interested very much in efficiency, and the point of view of, uh, of interrupts was to achieve this, uh, this efficiency that the typewriter, when it had a key, would interrupt and, and then the com computer would handle that. Well, uh, uh, 
there was, of course, the question of type out. And what I was annoyed about was that the while the type out was occurring, the computer was waiting, rather than having a waiting for a, what I called a back interrupt uh, when the character was com had been completely typed and the buffer was ready to receive um, another character. And now my impression is that the one flexor rider system had this fault, but that the three flexor rider system that you were designing did not have this fault. That's correct. That's my recollection. Herbs? We, I, I built a one flexor rider system before I added the other two. Maybe that's you know, I didn't even have the mercury wetted, I only had four mercury wetted relays to build one. The others were back ordered for four months. I, I, and without mercury wetted relays, those flexor riders raised hell with the rest of the computer system. Well, no, wait a minute. What? It, it well, could have been channel. that, uh, that the, the, maybe you're right. It I don't see that... seem to have disappeared. I don't think I ever met him. I see memos of his that were written with dates that were right before I came back to MIT in the end of January of 1959, the day that you'll live in infamy. But I don't ever recall meeting Arnold Seaton. Well, I met a guy named Kim Mailing in your group, I know. Yeah. Right. And I knew most of Corby's programmers, like Marjorie Merwin, who was a, a real hot shot. Yeah. That now, kid could program uh, better than Matt Now, Kate. There, uh, Siegel was uh, always paired with another person, Frank Helwig. Frank Helwig. Mm -hmm. Who uh, also I never met. Well, I think that group had pretty... They, <coughs> they left around that time. Uh, as uh, They were inherited from Whirlwind, weren't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and yes. it was a full-time staff that I guess we didn't have the research funding to support. Uh, Could it be, John, that your memory of a one flesh rider operation was really a stage in Herb's work when he, he couldn't have three, so he had only one? Yeah. Well, the following is possible now, uh, though I'd still like to see whether it is checked, is that Siegel had designed a one flex rider system, yeah, which but it wasn't work. built, and that Herb built a one on the way to three. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember design. being very annoyed with Herb at how long things were taking. Uh, because, of course, if I if the one, I could always imagine that the one that Siegel had designed was almost ready to go. Um, well, John, you always made light of engineering difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you still do. <laughs> there was a separate culture, John. Right. Occasionally, as, right. as an now, engineer, uh, I, I, I let took me ask the following thing. question about this. Um, <laughs> at some point, uh, perhaps as, in, as a response to this memo, of which I have a copy here that I wrote to Morrison, which is dated January 1st, 1759, yeah. uh, we got money from NSF for yeah. time-sharing research. That wasn't until 60. I'm not sure whether it was specifically time-sharing research, but we got money from NSF. Yes. There was okay. continuing support. Now, was... if it was for time-sharing research, then we had to write a proposal. Uh, because NSF doesn't give you money unless you unless you write a proposal, or at least I don't suppose they did at that time. They certainly don't now. They were a lot more flexible than then than now. They really were. Yeah. We got. Uh, I thought it was because we, got, we were so brilliant that we got. No, it. we got uh, money from uh, the sources of, of funding at those days were ONR, yeah. and NSF, and IBM. All right, but now there the, was there um, was early, earlier some some stuff from from uh, Rockefeller too. Could well, be. Well, but here here's my question. Did we write a proposal? And if so, who wrote it and what's in it? Because I have never seen it. Now, did I write part of it? Did Herb write it? Or did you write it? Or what? Uh, because it seems to me that if one wants to know what people were thinking of at that time, then uh, besides uh, my memo, the abstract, which I don't have, that Herb and I sent to ACM, um, that this would be a kind of valuable document. Yeah, I guess I'm a little bothered by this attempt to be online historians. Uh, 
because in fact, I have a whole file of papers and stuff and memos which are largely raw in the sense I haven't gone through them. Uh, I did browse through them a little bit before this meeting to kind of refresh myself, but I certainly didn't try to study them as a scholar. And there are proposals floating around. Uh, the chronology and what was asked for and so forth is tricky. Uh, my recollection is it was we were in a very tough era where we were trying to uh, convince uh, the, the manufacturers to do something. We were trying to convince the sponsors that it was an idea that had a lot of potential and at the same time find time to get something working. Uh, and we gradually clawed our way forward. Uh, but the thing that was important to me is the vision was set uh, quite early. You were largely instrumental in, in articulating it. And that was uh, relatively important, I think, because we knew where we were going. Back in those days, I can remember getting a, uh, funds from the Army research for some work in operations research. And the only proposal I, I put in was essentially the, the title for research in the general field of operations research. And that's all that yeah. was needed to, to, to get the grant. Well, I remember something. John, that at that time, uh, you and other people were also staff members of RLE. RLE was operating under a general contract, didn't have to have proposals, you see. So maybe that the initial work was done with RLE funding, I don't know for not, sure. Not the hardware. The not the hardware, the, no. the, 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 the people. Now, what I recall is that the second memory Oh, well, let, that me, was was the staff. Well, let me back off. The things, and I forget the exact chronology, but the, the key contributions were uh, IBM agreeing to put in uh, it's the, the, the bounds registers yeah. uh, and uh, trapping on, on I. When was that? It was before that demo. Of, CTSS was counting on it, so it was before the November '61 date. Uh, it was back uh, around the time of the direct data uh, device uh, discussion. Oh, now I understand. Okay, so the the and we didn't get those on the 709, and we had to kind of cross our fingers and hope everything was working right. And that was in the 7090. Was my recollection. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and furthermore, on the 7090, we got them to trap out all illegal instructions uh, and and I think also I.O. instructions. And we didn't want it to hang up. Exactly. Uh, the computer. And we also got them to put in a uh, an interrupt clock. So the halt we asked them to kill. So and those are key modifications to the CPU hardware. But then the and that was all necessary to get CTSS demonstrated. With uh, the groaning and moaning and uh, oh, we had to arm, pull, arm tug and pull. The things that were missing, which came uh, in the 61 2 area, era, were we didn't have a large disk file. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have any kind of a, a, a large scale uh, telecommunications controller. Yeah. And we got both of those out of IBM. And we concluded fairly early in the game that the problem of rewriting programs was so severe that we needed a second bank of memory in order to swap, put the supervisor over in that, in order to run up to 32K word programs. But like a jackass, I had a small programming group that thought we could redesign compilers so they would go segment by segment. Yeah, it's easy which to be. one of the world's great blind alleys. It's easy to be hard on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it turned out that the, the brute force approach was the most expedient. Uh, so we got it, and as I recall, NSF supported that first bank. Of yeah, the first I, I they they got the extra memory for us. Yeah. Really? Because yeah. that yeah. was I that. I I just remember, I don't. And it was that. done as kind of an aside. I, I can still rec uh, recall that they had some funds left over at the end of the fiscal <coughs> of their uh, granting year, and they wondered if if helping us buy some memory would yeah. would, would be a help. And we said yes, it really would. You know, <laughs> it was a very touch and go situation. Well, that's, that's interesting. <coughs> but remember. That at the price of the of a bank of memory at that time was one million dollars. It may have been a, por a portion of that memory, yeah. but in you any case, IBM gave us the rest. Yeah. Um, IBM, IBM see, was in the process of kind of humoring us. 
Yeah. Well, now, yeah. wait a minute. I think you guys are unfair to IBM. Um, <laughs> I'm talking. I'm not talking about Lauren yeah, Bullock. Us down to I'm not talking about Lauren Bullock. I'm talking about the upper management. No, I mean, yeah. but you're even unfair to the upper management of IBM. They didn't think of us as having anything to do whatsoever with their product development. Well, that may that may be, but well, uh, as far know. as the uh, as That's far right. as their helping with the timesharing project, I believe that their additional investment over supplying a, a uh, 7090 was a good deal more than a million dollars. And well, so that very, represented... very grudgingly given. It was given, I agree. Uh, but that was later, John. What? That was later. In no. the early days, when we were starting, our total budget for building this three flex rider system, and that was before we got an ONR contract in June of 60, 61, with some NSF money, I think Phil had gotten from someplace because we did it for fifteen hundred bucks, and I know I was putting in eighty-hour weeks to build that sucker, and all I ever got from IBM was, "You may damn well sure your interface circuits are exactly this." And the second thing was, "Here's the pin layout on our on our connector," and that was given grudgingly. Both sure of them. was. Well, okay, but that that's. That's, but they that's did true. fly us down to Poughkeepsie, and you and I had a chance to hold the control. Well, it was a it was a very schizophrenic attitude inside IBM. People like Lauren Bullock were pulling as hard as they knew oh, yeah. how to yeah. make it yeah. work, and yeah. they were fighting inside IBM trying to get support. And that uh, there were other extremists who viewed it was just kind of appeasing us and letting us fool around. Well, in those days, they were still hanging on to punch cards. They well, still they are. obviously, you get a check from. IBM, it's still on a punch card. <laughs> yeah. Or from the federal government. Well, yeah. um, that is, I will believe that IBM has gone into the model modern world and checks from, from IBM are no longer on punch cards. Um, now, uh, let me think about the follow, uh, raise the following question. When did we switch from the 704 to the 709? Okay, I have that one nailed. Because I did an embarrassing... <coughs> Seven oh oh, excuse me, seven oh four to nine. Oh boy, wait a minute. That must be in the the. It was before. Uh, it was end of sixty. Before nineteen sixty one. Yeah. Uh, oh, eight, eight, nine and then to a ninety. So right. Oh, wait, wait, we have the nine. Well, it was, I mean, that's obviously documented. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. But the I, I can the look transition up. from nine to ninety was supposed to occur. Uh, in the early spring of 62. And the reason I know it, it occurred more like July was I 62. had the embarrassment of having uh, anticipated the transition and I wrote this paper for the spring joint of 62 and it referred to the 7090. And in fact, we were, had done our work on a 709 and I had expected by the time the paper came out that I would have it all working again on the 7090. And of course I hadn't until I was um, this was when? Spring 62. So I, I never made that yeah, mistake that makes, again of yeah. trying to anticipate something about <laughs> Because it. Uh, the 709 went to uh, Slater's operation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that right. was and a, I well, think that a, was the yeah. spring that was 62, a, I believe. That was the MIT fall. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. now, my 1959 memo starts out, this memorandum is based on the assumption that MIT will be given a transistorized IBM 709 about July 1960. Didn't now, happen. this was... Well, Didn't transistorized happen. 709, yes, 709. Uh, indicates that even the name 7090... Was not known yet. It yes. was not known yet. Um... Well, and that so that's consistent. Now the first actual seventy seven ninety came out was delivered to Sylvania, I think, in December of fifty nine, because as you recall, the purpose of the seven oh nine was for the seventy ninety was for the BMU system. We asked for a seven oh ninety, and they gave us a seven oh nine. Uh, that's right. Can I cast a little bit of light? Yeah, I remember. The first year I came back, we had a 704, all of 59. There was heavy planning going on for the 709. My major concern was, oh shit, is this going to mean I got to rip out everything and redesign it to fit the 709? We got around that, but as of the infamous report date 
of March 61, the comp center had a 709, was planning a 7090 by 62. The Slater's group had nothing, but they were planning to get your old 709 in uh, 62 as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, okay, my feeling is that the one Flexor Rider demo was on the 704. That uh, could very well be. I, it had I'd, the same plug. Yep. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, now, I'd like to talk about this committee, this infamous committee. Now, um, uh, can I, I was... Can I yeah, go ahead. finish up a loose end here? Because I think we're really talking about the pre-Mac era. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and... There, there was a period, a hiatus between the CTSS demo in November '61 and the Max Summer Study in the spring, in the summer of '63, and the intervening period was, was uh, had some important transitions going on, because it was in that period that we first acquired a disc. We also acquired uh, a swapping drum, uh, a fast drum. From I, this is using IBM equipment, and we also got the uh, extra bank of memory, and we also got this this giant kludge of a telecommunications controller called the 7750, and that's what turned this made the system into a a, a useful, yes. a usable system with more than three typewriters, and secondly, it's also was working us well enough along so that as Mac formed. It was decided to clone it yeah. and to get a duplicate for the summer of which arrived in, during the, or arrived in the fall actually the right fall. after the summer session uh, of sixty three. So, was in October. so all of this early work at the computation center was was absolutely critical for the startup of Mac, and in fact, uh, a lot of the outside world thought that Mac started uh, in a magnificent burst of, of energy when in fact it was standing on this long background of development, oh, yeah. which was quite crucial to getting started. Okay. Okay, end, now end this is the infamous committee. Uh, uh, us un we underlings were very much unhappy about the fact that of the way MIT chose to do this, uh, to produce this big shot committee and then underneath it the underling committee that would do the actual work. And as I recall, uh, I, it, the rumor was that the over committee never met uh, because of uh, inability of Hill and you to get along or something like that. Instant fishing was the oh, we met. of it. Uh, we uh, met. We never seemed to be at, at MIT at the same time. Uh, we remember meeting. Jerry Wiesner yeah. was in Washington. A few times. Yeah, yeah this is the thing that puzzles me, that uh, there is a reference to Jerry Wiesner, but Jerry Wiesner never participated. But he was a know. member of the committee. Yeah, he was, but yeah, he, he was in Washington. Him. Well, in any case, let me, then, so there, there was this two-level committee of which Herb was the uh, chairman of the, uh, of the lower, of the lower level. Um, now, the committee had to produce this report, uh, which involved this market research. And indeed, it is certainly true that I, at least, had no stomach for market research. Uh, in fact, <coughs> well, I'll, I'll come to that later. And um, that one of the things that happened during the meetings of that committee was um, a tendency to elaborate the concept of time-sharing, and in particular to, uh, well, there was Doug Ross who had ideas about fancying up indexing, uh, as I recall. And, oh, yeah, he was, he was in the graphic I.O. business. Oh, yeah. With a real problem. Uh, and um, then there was somebody, I suppose it was you, that was interested in paging and say, what later became paging and segmentation. So, Modular programming. Let's, that uh, was well, I was, okay. and now, I was interested in the uh, system side of it. Yeah. My uh, objective was to try to keep it simple, and there was a, this tension over the elaborating and segmentation ideas. Came and later. The page, what, yeah, much later. I was mostly in the system side. Yeah. Just uh, well, I don't it. remember... Just trying to make uh, it work. I, what I do remember is trying to prevent elaboration, and I'm, but I'm not sure who were the main forces 
for a lab and certainly Doug wanted, Ross was one. The meteorologists wanted a very high speed floating point capability, full of Fortran, interactive, all the good things that the Weather Bureau had. But North. that wasn't the problem because they weren't directly represented on the committee. Yes, they were. Oh, Norm, yes, they Norm were. Was, uh, they were on the working what, what, what committee. Was his name? Norm I picked no, the biggest guy, the biggest the one, user. One I have there heard. wasn't any major user at MIT that wasn't on our working committee. Uh -huh. And if all there right. was, he was invited to join. Okay. I was dumb enough to do that. Uh, all right. Now, then there was this split after the uh, report where you wanted to get Stretch and the rest and. Uh, while something grand was being de designed, and the rest of us wanted to get together and produce an RFP. Um, and then after the split, the committee was reconstituted with me as chairman. No, Ron Howard. No. No, no, he was the chairman. Uh, and I I then we did produce a, a version of the report, which was mainly your report, except with different conclusions. Um, and we did produce an RFP, and we had a meeting with Stratton, and there was a, a very serious tactical mistake in this meeting in that we wanted to be sure that we were asking for enough money to do it. And we took an amount, we proposed an amount of money that would be sufficient to do it that I'm sure frightened Stratton. Uh, because we, we wanted a million words of memory and so forth. Then after that, um, um, uh, some time after we were going to go ahead on the RFP, that is to send the RFP out, I guess Stratton hadn't quite agreed to send the RFP out. The RFP, there was a question, well, we don't have the money, and we say, well, we'll be frank about that fact. We'll say that we don't have the money yet. Uh, Burroughs, I remember, we actually had meetings with computer companies. Burroughs was the more th most forthcoming at the time. Uh, IBM was keeping secret what they were doing, basically. Um, there, there was some, I remember going to see Amdahl in, well, they were uh, the in Poughkeepsie. They were doing on the 360. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, there was this meeting between Lauren Bullock and I guess Bradley and Stratton. Yeah. In which, uh, after that, Stratton came back to us and said, well, what about, IBM says in six weeks they may have a proposal. So we waited for IBM around. Now, uh, we waited and waited and waited long after six weeks. Six months was more like it. And then somebody said to me, and I forget whether it was Hill or um, Stratton himself, but I suspect it was Hill, that um, we got to redo the market survey to really establish that there's a need. And at that point, I became very receptive to offers from Stanford. And uh, because that was just one thing that I wasn't going to do was any more market survey. I felt that enough had been done. Or well, all that could call it could have been done. Research. I mean, market survey is sort of like sanitary engineering compared mm -hmm. to garbage collecting. <laughs> it was a little bit more than that. We had to establish numbers for capacity and try no, to figure out uh, who was going to do what to who. You when. may have had a scientific attitude towards it, but no. I certainly did not. It was and as far as I was concerned, it was a goddamn no, market would, survey. You would give your soul at that point for a million words of memory. And no. my fight with you was that, John, you're not going to solve the artificial intelligence problem if you have a million words. No, well, my, my, I didn't believe it would. No, that, I, wasn't, that wasn't what I was that, interested in as far as the million words of memory. I wasn't that expecting 256, that. 256,000 would cripple you completely. But That's I, how you felt. I think, the, the, you know, leave out the, the coloration of the language. I, I think the, the bulk of the committee, in my recollection, is, felt sympathetic to John's point of view, namely that we shouldn't analyze the need by surveying the users. But rather, because we felt we were proposing a, a rather drastic reorganization of the way computing was done. And I think most people really believe that, in the sense that you, you have to remind yourself of how ghastly it was to work with batch processing in those days. Yeah. But there was a TX0 up on the floor. That was a real exception. Yeah. Only a handful of yeah, people had right. access yeah. to it. And in fact, that was the spirit of it that one wanted, as we know today. Uh, but. In those days, it was really uh, infuriating to try to, to get anything done with the batch processing mode, which had become really rigid, uh, a rigid uh, process. And uh, we had a free computer. 
in those days, uh, so that in fact, and nobody had in their research contracts funding for computer time, yeah. so we couldn't buy any more computers. We were absolutely flat on our back trying to get up and run. And it was a, so I think most people were put off by this kind of uh, bureaucratic uh, approach, study the problem some more and tell me why we need it. And that's, uh, John basically exploded on that point. The rest of it stuck around. <laughs> well, I was innocent of that. Like um, then I was in a car or sulking. Yeah. Okay, but now let me, that is one, I don't know whether I had that me, this metaphor then or didn't get it till later, but the metaphor was the steam shovel wasn't invented by taking market surveys among ditch diggers. Yeah, um, yeah it's a change yeah. of life, it's a change of style. Yeah. Uh, so it seemed to me that uh, what we would get from uh, any kind of market survey was merely the answer, what we already have, only more. Yeah. Um, and therefore, I was very resistant to, but it's strange, to doing John, that market survey. I felt survey. the same way in a different way, because I hated keyboards. I was being pushed by people like Norbert and people who, who thought sim graphically, not symbolically. Right. And you guys thought that 50 teletypes, Hosanna, it's the new, it's right. the new coming. Well, so different there, you know, we were young, we had a different way of looking at it. Different set of compromises. Yeah, yeah. right. right. Uh, and... Uh, yeah. It is strange that I do not recall the uh, the flap about essentially the administration saying uh, go back to the drawing board and make a market survey. They were dragging, I don't recall. They were, dragging, they were dra they were dragging their feet. The fact is that... Maybe Hill they, said that to me. They, well, Since Hill said it to her, uh, maybe they he might have repeated to, it to me. They tried to simply okay. didn't have the money yeah. and didn't know where to get it. Mm. All right? This is simply, and I recall the frustration that there was no money and nothing was happening as a result. But the going back to make a market survey, I don't recall. Well, Perhaps it's because I was at Lincoln during the academic year 61, 62, so that uh, I, I, I was not as immersed as I was before. The report was presented, when it was, in the spring 61? Yeah. Yeah. So I just come out when I moved to Lincoln, and perhaps that's why I don't recall. Uh, and, and the amount the of money about it. Yeah. Right? And John's, as I recall, the amount of money we were asking for was something like fifteen to eighteen million dollars. Yeah. yeah. yeah.